the third session of our Beyond Bricks and Mortar webinar series. The second language learning context requires a solid understanding of the best practices that can support student confidence, proficiency, and achievement in second language learning. And I am Jordan Sloan. I am the bilingual literacy coach for Renfrew County District School Board, and I am the director of professional development for the OMLTA. And I'm going to be your host for this webinar series and for this evening's webinar. A link is going to be provided in the chat at the end of tonight's session for your feedback and for suggestions for future professional learning. So if you can please take a moment to fill that in, we'd really appreciate it. Tonight we're going to be exploring a topic that's new to most of us as teachers in elementary and in secondary panels, and that is assessment and evaluation in the digital environment. We are going to begin with a presentation by each of our panelists, showcasing their learning, their ideas, and their takeaways. We are going to then address some of the most common questions that were sent in during the registration. And we're going to finish with an open floor discussion. If you have any questions that you would like the panelists to address, please write them in the chat and I will do my best to bring them forward at the end. Our learning goals tonight are to know. So we are going to identify the ways in which assessment for as and of learning for FSL learners in the distance learning environment and hybrid learning environments differ from face-to-face -face learning. We are going to identify effective and equitable practices for assessing FSL learners in the distance learning environment and the hybrid learning environment. And we will learn to adjust conventional face-to-face -face assessments in the FSL classroom to suit the needs of diverse learners in the distance learning environment and hybrid learning environments. I'd like to introduce you to the panelists this evening. Erin Colson is a grade seven, eight French immersion and grade eight core French teacher teaching online in Peel. She is also a Google certified trainer who's passionate about empowering modern learners and inspiring success in FSL learners. Adam White is joining us. He is a learning consultant and has been working with a team of French teachers in, our, in his board. Um, he was inspired to support teachers because of the ways he saw confidence growing in students when they were given the opportunity to use their French for authentic and meaningful purposes. And our third panelist this evening is Haley Brooks. I'm sorry, I'm letting people in at the same time as I'm presenting. Uh, is an FSL ELL learning coach in Timmins, Ontario, and currently teaching grade two and three French immersion virtually. She is a Dell formatrice and correctrice and outside of professional life, loves being outside in Northern Ontario. I'm now going to pass you over to Erin Colson, who's going to start our presentation this evening. Merci beaucoup, Jordan, et bonne soirée à vous tous. Je vous préviens que je vais animer cette partie de la formation en anglais. So let's get started. To begin tonight, we are going to speak about how to build a framework for assessment in FSL within both the online and the hybrid environments. Jordan, tu peux avancer. Voilà. When the pandemic first hit and classrooms all over the world moved online, many teachers coped by trying to maintain familiar patterns of learning and trying to replicate traditional models of schooling. Teachers really quickly learned that it is even more important in the online environment, however, to offer meaningful student-centered tasks as well as opportunities to nurture that human connection, which we've all been missing since we've moved to the online platform. The online environment has led us to rethink how we frame learning opportunities and the ways in which we evaluate the success of our students. When we explore the differences between the online, the hybrid, and the traditional classrooms, such as you see on your screen, we really need to ask ourselves what kinds of learning patterns are most successful successful? How do they differ between the learning environments? How can we foster socio-emotional learning using the digital tools that we have at hand? As you can see in the graphic towards the middle in the red section, it shares in all of these settings, teachers guide learning, communicate with students, monitor assessment, and develop course content. But where online instruction differs from some of the other models, is the need to leverage technologies, technologies that we may not be entirely familiar with so that we can create adaptive, flexible learning environments that feel personal despite the absence of that in-person connection. Go ahead, Jordan. 
As we dive into effective assessment practices in a digital environment this evening, I want you to think about your kind of classroom. And with that being said, we have a fun little minds on just to get you thinking about what you prioritize in your FSL classroom. Is it this or is it that? You could try this out on Twitter if you're feeling very high techy this evening and you could screenshot the picture and annotate your preferences. If you're feeling the tech bug, what you can do is head on over to hashtag OMLTA and share your preferences. But if you're feeling low digital, what we can do in our class is offer students this kind of a provocation. So with a show of hands, let's take a look at a couple of these just to dive into assessment. Please put your hand up if you prefer holistic rubrics. So use the raise hand feature at the bottom right hand of your screen and raise your hand if you prefer. All right, we've got some hands up there. All right, I'll ask that you put your hand down. And what about single point rubrics? How many of us have moved on over to single point rubrics? Raise your hand, please, if your preference is the single point rubric. All right, there I can see there's about seven or eight that have raised their hands. Let's try one more. Do you prefer a student-led classroom, even in a virtual or hybrid environment? Please raise your hand if you prefer the student-led environment as best you can with the tools that we have. All right, I see about 10 hands up. Thank you so much. Hands down for a moment. And what about a teacher-led environment? So think about the way that online learning must by necessity look different. How many of you feel most confident in a teacher-led online environment? All right, we see some hands up there. So thank you for sharing and starting to think about this provocation and how your priorities may well have changed since we moved online or hybrid. Jordan, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So in the online environment, answers are really at the student's fingertips more than ever before. Google Translate becomes ever so tempting. If it wasn't tempting before, well, it's really tempting now. And so the focus of learning, well, it needs to change and it needs to change in a hurry. It can no longer primarily be about memorization of content. Instead, it needs to shift to competencies and conceptual understandings. In other words, as you see on the screen, the triangulation of evidence becomes even more important. But we need to ask ourselves, how is this going to look different in that online world versus the face-to-face -face environment? So the graphics you see here give you an idea of how conversations, observations, and products can in fact be included in online assessment practices. Instead of paper and pencil tasks, consider asking your students to demonstrate their learning within something like a collaborative podcast. Mine used a tool called Soundtrap to record their responses to a podcast that we were listening to. In place of something like a traditional lab or a demonstration, why don't you consider asking the students to show their learning in an interactive notebook? or maybe using a digital portfolio tool, something like Google Sites or Adobe Spark or even Flipgrid. How will the triangulation of evidence look different in this online world? Go ahead, Jordan. So figuring out what students are actually learning within that online environment is crucial. Teachers don't need to entirely reinvent themselves and reinvent those formative assessment practices that we're used to in the classroom, things like exit tickets, think pair share activities, these things do work virtually, but we need to reimagine them just a little bit. Why don't you consider using a tool like Google Forms for something like a temperature check or an exit ticket or a quiz? At the top left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see an example of such a Google Form. So my students were asked to listen to an episode of Les Sapiens from ICI to TV, which is a wonderful streaming source of French language content. And the students demonstrated their learning based on the content of the show within a Google form. Then we can look at analytics as a class and see where the class made those errors and we can revisit wherever there are gaps. You can even save yourself some time because Google forms will allow you to auto grade 
and time is of the essence when we are busy planning those rich activities in the online world. Perhaps you've heard of a tool like Nearpod or Pear Deck or Desmos, and the Pear Deck and Desmos logos are there on your screen. Using tools like these, we can observe students while they demonstrate their learning in real time. So where we might walk about the room and have a quick heart to heart with the student and see what they need support with, well, you can identify those gaps and uh, see what's going on with the students anonymously through Desmos and Pear Deck, but you can also see their responses using tools like drag drop, text-based, or picture responses. So on the screen there, you'll see an example of a word bank and using the drag and drop feature, you can build word banks as a class, you can review vocabulary, and you can have students visibly demonstrate their learning. Another tool you likely have heard of is Jamboard. Jamboard is a powerful tool to frame assessment, particularly in this online environment. Students can use the annotate features to mark up an image, provide a written response, or like they did here, capture their thinking en français about the year in pictures. And you'll see there, there's an image of Kobe Bryant and the students were asked to respond using expressions such as je remarque que, je pense que, ceci me fait penser de. And so using a visual provocation and a markup tool like Jamboard, we can really get some insight into what they are thinking. Go ahead, Jordan. So it's really important to create authentic assessment activities, whether they are diagnostic, formative, or summative. The graphic you see here shares some of the best assessment practices within that distance learning environment. Consider embedding gamification, for example. Kids love games like Kahoot, Quizlet, Gymkit, especially the new Among Us version, which is uh, supposed to be coming back in another couple of weeks, or something like Blukit. Why not check for understanding while students are enjoying playing an online game and get some of your formative assessment that way? Continue to provide clear and frequent feedback, whether you're using something like the comments feature in a tool like Google Docs, or you might be using something like the audio comments feature using a tool like Moat, which is now a built-in extension in the Google Slides environment. Or perhaps you might create a feedback portfolio using Google uh, Slides or Google Docs or Google Sites so that the students can document their progress over time. Whatever approach you choose, it's extremely important to break down those complex assessments into smaller components when you're working online so that you can have frequent check-ins, whether you're using audio feedback or written feedback, but so that students have checkpoints at various points in the learning environment and can act on your suggestions. Go ahead, Jordan. And Mote, M-O-T-E, yes, it allows voice notes and it now has built-in integration into Google Slides. So you don't have to uh, record using another voice tool like Vocaroo or Voice Notes. It is built in slides and it will allow you to provide audio feedback to students. So in speaking about feedback, effective feedback should be timely, actionable, and it should improve student performance. So here you have some examples of ways in which I provide ongoing feedback to students. Some of my students use a tool called an interactive notebook. Slides Mania, and you'll see the logo on the screen there, is a really great source for templates, not just for teacher-led lessons, but also for hyperdocs or for things like interactive notebooks. All of my students use interactive notebooks and they link their daily work as well as their assessments in one place so that we do have that progress over time in a pictorial form. But most importantly, myself as the teacher, I go to one spot and everything's there and it's nicely organized. When I provide summative feedback to my students, I actually embed the feedback in a shared doc using Google Docs and I link that to a Google site. Then parents, students, and myself, it's a one-stop shop that they can get feedback. So whichever tool you prefer, the key message here is thinking about your workflow, 
How can you maximize your time while also ensuring that you provide timely, actionable feedback? And some of the suggestions I have to that end are audio notes, which are quicker than writing notes, using something like Moat, or using an interactive notebook or a portfolio tool such as Google Sites. Go ahead, George. So like many of you, I've really had to rethink this past year how I frame my assessments. Pictured here, you'll see an example of a digital literature circle. And so my students were asked to select a short story from the website called Storybooks Canada. And you'll notice that there's a little arrow and that indicates that it is a clickable link. So if you have opened up the bit.ly link that my good friend Louis shared in the clavardage, then you can get access to a copy of this deck. And perhaps this is something you might want to facilitate with your students. So in a nutshell, they're asked to select a short story of interest from the website Storybooks Canada. If you're not familiar with Storybooks Canada, it offers leveled, culturally responsive texts in multiple languages. From there, students were asked to complete a set of predictions using the picture word inductive model. They were also asked to practice reading the text by listening to a read aloud. So if you go in Storybooks Canada, you can actually play back the story. You can select the speed for the playback and you can see a transcription so that students can follow along using the playback mode on Storybooks and they can practice their pronunciation. For the culminating task, which is also embedded within that deck, they were asked to create a virtual classroom. So these were all of the rage last spring, and I capitalized on that by asking the students to create their very own virtual classroom. So what you see on the right-hand side is an example of a student in core French, and this was her classroom. And so she needed a pictorial representation of herself. She needed to design the French classroom. And hidden behind those images are things like access to Storks Canada, you can demonstrate learning about the book, as well as une bande annonce to promote the story. And there's a few other things that are hidden there. So she has become the teacher, and in a creative way, she has framed the learning for the other students in her class. So if any of those learning opportunities and assessment checkpoints is of interest to you, please do click on that Cercle de Littérature en Virtuel and all of those um, pieces of the workflow are embedded there. And essentially, this is an activity you could use in your classroom tomorrow. It's simply a matter of making a copy of the deck. Jordan, super merci. Perfect. So communication looks very different in the online world. I teach grade seven and eight students. And in my experience, they are often comfortable sharing in the chat. They are not comfortable being seen on screen and they are less inclined to share the ideas aloud. So I have to trick them and I trick them by motivating them, empowering them and getting them all fired up about the questions I have on the screen. So to encourage them to unmute and share their voice, I encourage you to build a climate, a culture of human connection. And so one of the ways I do this is by having students participate in fun little check-ins, particularly at the start of the day, to spark that conversation. Alternatively, you can consider engaging students in student-directed models. Consider using a themed hyperdoc. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see an example of a hyperdoc for the unit in grade seven science, la chaleur, and all of the resources needed to complete the learning cycle can be found by clicking on those buttons there. So this hyperdoc scaffolds communication, inquiry, student-led collaboration, all about the topic of heat, and it includes multiple multimedia resources, which provide opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning in both written and audio form. So again, if you are interested in that, you will see that there is the arrow there. That's a clickable link. It will bring you to a PDF version that you could share theoretically with your students. Go ahead, Jordan, I've got two more. One of the most challenging aspects of working within an online environment 
for myself anyway, is really engaging students in what I would call authentic writing opportunities. Many of you have perhaps struggled with this as well. So one solution that I have found is a learning model called La Tuité. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Tuité, it is a contraction of une dictée and tuiteur. So students are partnered with students elsewhere in the world and they exchange ideas around a written text. Students first engage in a traditional dictée and then from there, they are placed in groups, and it was myself who chose the groups, to rewrite the dictée as best they can. So during this phase, they have to debate and defend their vocabulary choices. Everyone in the group needs to come to agreement about how to write the text. And the reason it's called suité is that it is the length of a tweet. And so these are very, very short texts. They are chosen intentionally to meet the needs of the students and there is a community of teachers internationally who decide what those texts will look like. So as students are debating they need to agree how to write the text and once they do that text will get sent to your partnered class. So in our case for this most recent round of tweet day um, we were working with a class in France and so when we receive the work of the French students my students in turn have to take a look at what they have written. They have to identify the error. They have to come up with a reason as to why the mistake is present in the text. And then they need to justify it and classify the error. So there's a lot of deductive reasoning that goes on here and conversation. So really authentic idea. And it was a great way of constructively speaking about the, um, the writing. And I have a funny story to share very quickly in that I put my students in breakout rooms while they were having these conversations so that I was less of a, an interloper. And when I, when I popped in, one of the groups didn't realize I was there. And I heard one of my students say, let's just put this in Google Translate. I'm like, ah, Google Translate. She says, let's just put it in Google Translate and check if it's right. And then another student says, are you kidding? This isn't going to work in Google Translate. They all started laughing and then they noticed that I was there. So for me, the debate continued. How do we correct the text? We can't just go put this in Google Translate and hand it into Madame. And so it made for really messy, authentic learning. And it enabled me to make observations about the ways in which students were engaged in constructive conversation about grammar and vocabulary. So again, if the Tuité is of interest to you, uh, there's a fantastic website called La Tuité, which you can check out. But if you're curious as to how I frame the first part, which is la tuité individuelle et la tuité négociée, you can click on the upper deck. And if you're interested in how I animate, uh, animate facilitate those conversations around les corrections, then you can click on that second deck. Both of those will force you to make a copy and give you access to those decks, which can be customized. And so finally, as a takeaway, I would like to share a hyperdoc with you that I helped to co-create this summer as a resource for new teachers in the Peel District School Board. If you click on this link, and Jordan, this time I'm very quickly going to ask you to click because I do want them to see what this actually looks like. When Jordan clicks, you are going to find if it works if not then i'll just drop the link in the chat so that you can see um it doesn't look like it's working for you that's okay jordan so within this hyperdoc you'll find sample assessments that are geared towards intermediate students and these resources and assessments they're not necessarily geared towards fsl students but what you will find that i believe is helpful is a list of digital platforms and tools that are going to be used depending on the situation to leverage learning for both hybrid and online frameworks. You'll also find some very specific examples of what assessment looks like in the of, as, and for learning environments. So it's a very, very rich document. I think you'll find it helpful. Um, it was intended for new teachers in Peel, but quite frankly, I think it's a phenomenal document learning how to frame assessment and how to modify assessment using those digital tools that we have at hand. So with that, 
Adam White is going to now speak to you about models for listening and speaking in the distance learning environment. Thank you so much, Aaron. And Aaron, there were a few really good questions in the chat that um, we may want to circle back to in our in our question and answer period. I just want to let you know they're there. Wonderful. So, I'll take a look while you're while you're sharing. Yeah, you. For sure. So, grazie, gracias, arigato, um, uh, miigwech, merci to all of you for taking time out of your uh, evenings to come together and have this professional discussion. Aaron, thank you for your uh, resources. What a treasure chest of different resources people can use and take away. So thank you for sharing those. Um, the first thing I want to begin with before we dive into talking a little bit more about how to value speaking and listening is I want to ask every one of you as, as language learners, as people that have learned a language along the way, whatever language that is, um, I would like you to just reflect on a moment that comes to mind spontaneously where somebody helped you to become a better language speaker. And I'm going to ask you in the chat in a moment, uh, and I'm sorry to Aaron who I just said to look at the, um, to, to look at the chat, but in a moment I'm going to ask you to put in the chat one word or maybe two words that characterize that moment that somebody really helped you as a language learner, just whatever word comes to mind. So go ahead and do that, and I'll pause for a couple of seconds while I read those. Aha, thank you. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Patience, culture. Thank you. Culture, caring, confidence, practice. Thank you. Don't fret over the errors, good connections, real life events, thank you. Insistent, warmth, feedback, okay to make mistakes, support, culture, keep them coming, confidence, had fun and enjoyed the humor and silliness. Thank you, there's the chat. I'm gonna ask, uh, we can stop there, but if you have something to say, you can add it. Human connection, those are awesome. Lots of talking French. And so what I've just done there um, would be an example of how I would use, and I did have a chance to work a bit with a grade five, six virtual immersion class just before the holidays this year. And what I did there um, was a quick check-in, but it's going to inform where I go with this discussion. So it's almost one of those assessment uh, as learning or assessment for learning pieces, uh, just to check in to see where you're at. Because one of my thoughts is we really want to create that environment, that same kind of environment for our students that that person created for you. And I will just point out there that not a lot of people made a specific correction of a mistake in particular. In fact, there was a lot of don't sweat the small mistakes. Um, nobody pointed out uh, a specific vocabulary error. There was the support, there was the cultural piece, the appreciation piece, the patience piece. And those are all the things that are best practices when it comes to assessing students. So all of that is meant to frame where I'm gonna go next. So merci beaucoup, Jordan. Um, we'll look at our first slide in this section to remind us, and this is from a wonderful resource on transforming FSL that is called um, Grammar in Action or Grammaire en Action. And within that resource, this image references our A1 and A2 and B1 learners really. And it really provides us with that visual of what is most important for our language learners. And I love these pie charts and I love reminding teachers of them, but I think as teachers, we even have to go further than that and share these with our parents. We have to be educating parents uh, that this is where their students are at in their learning. And we need to be helping our students uh, to understand that it's okay that in the very beginning, you need to be listening to lots of French. We had some awesome music on at the start. Et merci beaucoup, Jordan, pour ça. It put a smile on my face. But it also was just great exposure to that French, rich French language and vocabulary that we can hear. We need our students to be talking. And yes, there has to be some reading and writing that goes on. But it's not until we get to B2. And we can't put like an age or a grade level because it's all a continuum. But I think as colleagues, we can all agree that our students aren't reaching B2 until well into their secondary years for the most part. So with that in mind, most of our students are still in those first two pie charts, and we want to really focus on that in our learning, but also in our assessment practices. 
Merci beaucoup, Jordan. So the couple of things I wanted to dive into with our curriculum documents, both elementary and secondary, that really give us permission to change the way we look at assessment. And Aaron talked about a lot of these already. But within our curriculum document, there's a vision and there's goals right at the beginning. And, and I find teachers, they know that we, we know they're there, but we're so focused sometimes on our, on our expectations for our grade level that we forget that front matter of our curriculum that really frames everything. So two of the goals that I think really apply well in terms of giving permission to be creative in our assessments and to be new in the way we look at things are the goal that students need to use French to communicate to inter and interact effectively in a variety of social settings, which pulls back to Aaron's idea about the social pieces that we're missing. And then we have to use effective language learning strategies. And if you go back to any of your curriculum expectations at any level in French, you're going to see the word strategies come up more often than you think. And that's another way to look at assessment is to help our students think about strategies. And if we go back to the words that you just put in the chat, a lot of that supportive and encouraging and caring, we're building up your strategies to learn a language and use a language. They weren't building up your knowledge necessarily. That was a byproduct, but it was the strategies that were helping you. Merci, Jordan. And if we continue on that, we go to this uh, uh, below the same table that I just showed you, is that we want our students to acquire a strong oral foundation in the French language and focus on communicating in French. We want our students to understand the value of learning another language, and we want them to develop the skills needed to strengthen traits of resilience. And I think that's so cool that our curriculum document references resilience right from the beginning and to secure a sense of self through opportunities to learn adaptive management, coping skills, and so forth. Coming back to the word resilience, though, I think a lot of our fear around assessment in the hybrid and in the distance learning models is that it doesn't quite feel and look the same that we had in the classroom. But what an opportunity to help our students grow in that resilience and grow in their abilities to you know, independently choose strategies or with help choose strategies that are going to uh, push them along as language learners. So any of these things that are at the front matter of your curriculum are also fair game for you to work into your assessment. So we can be asking ourselves, are our students acquiring that strong oral foundation? Are they growing in their confidence? Are they understanding the value of learning another language? Yes, we need to do more than that. And Jordan did a great, uh, Aaron, I should say, did a great job of showing us some of the tools she's using to build those skills. But if you dig down deep enough, everything she's doing ties back to these goals. And these goals tie very closely to the words that I saw in the chat a moment ago. Merci, Jordan. So I want to frame our, our discussion on how do we help students acquire a strong oral foundation then? And how can we shift the language or the focus of effective language learning strategies? So how can we shift our focus to looking at those strategies, that is? Okay, merci, Jordan. So we'll look at a couple of things. We know this is what we want our classroom to look at look like and i've put a link into this this is a snapshot from a video on transforming fsl that shows all kinds of great strategies for building that language um, interactive piece in a classroom so it's how do we take this model and be creative about creating it in a hybrid or in a distance learning model merci jordan and uh, what we're going to do is look at grade eight expectations these are grade eight immersion but they're very similar to every other um, they're very similar to every other expectation, core, extended, and immersion. Uh, but it's in the speaking expectations. So we know we want to evaluate speaking to communicate, speaking to interact, and intercultural. So in keeping that in mind, I'm then going to create a tool for my myself to be able to assess this when the students get into their work. So Jordan, on the next slide, we have an image of a tool that I'm going to create if I'm correct, uh, after this one. So these are the specific expectations. And then we go into the tool. So I'm going to create a tool like this, and it's going to be a table. And if I have access to a printer, I'm going to print this off and have it beside me and use paper and pen as part of my, my plethora of assessment tools. But I've created the legende at the top, and I've made myself little um, symbols or little um, short forms 
for what I want to evaluate. And you'll see why in a moment. So in this particular case for this task, I, wanted the, I want the students to show me des comportements positifs d'interaction, des bonnes questions, puis des bonnes réponses uh, logiques. And I want to see their uh, vocabulaire spontané, their, their use of that spontaneous vocabulary. So I've got my class here of Aaron, Haley, Jordan, and Adam. And this is the task they're going to work on in order to, for me to see these skills. And I was thinking, how do we create an action-oriented task? So Jordan, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to give the students this picture and maybe a couple others, but I'm very, I really like the idea of it in second language learning using a lot of visuals. So as I give the students this picture, their task is going to be to create a club uh, uh, for students that are going to work together to protect the environment. Action oriented, we have an outcome, and I'm going to have them talk about this. Merci beaucoup, Jordan. So this is going to be their task. Uh, we want to see, they're going to have a bit of time to develop their vocabulary. I might even send them away to build a language bank themselves to bring back to our discussion. I might say, take the next 15 minutes. You can stay in the meet, but turn your cameras off. Go wherever you have to do. Use um, uh, word reference, use any electronic tools, use a good old dictionary if you have one. But find as many words as you can that relate to that picture I've just shown you and to the environment. Then we're going to come back and their task is going to be um, in small groups, probably groups of three or four students. So I can really listen to conversation. Uh, we can see what the task is going to be. By the end, they're going to plan a community project. So if we go to the next slide, Jordan. So as the students talk about these things in their small group, I really, my goal is to be a listener and I'm going to take notes. So you can see for Aaron, I saw two times that she was really showing that uh, positive interacting behavior. And I've taken notes that she encouraged other people to take their turns. I also see Erin's not answering a lot of questions. She's letting other people. So that's maybe a next step for her is she needs to jump in and answer. Uh, thanks, um, Jordan. Next slide, please. On the next slide, you can see that we are adding uh, to that, that Adam is, um, you know, I've highlighted Adam in orange, and if I was writing by pen, I might actually give him an X over the CI because his behavior was he interrupted twice to have his turn to talk. Um, and and that's, a, that's something to be aware of. So I'm putting an X. It's very quick symbols for me to reference. And I've noted that Jordan used a great expression, crise planétaire, and maybe she went and found that when I gave them a chance to go away and fine vocabulary, but the point is she used it. So I want to include that in there. Um, so as I look at this, um, as I look at this, I can start pretty quickly to determine levels, right? I'm seeing that Haley's asking questions, answering questions, using her spontaneous behavior and showing positive behavior. So Haley's probably on her way to a level three plus or a four. Uh, I could see Aaron probably needs to answer some questions or uh, give some réponses. And I can see Adam probably has some things to work on. So we're probably looking at some three minuses or two pluses in there. So um, these are the kinds of things I'm quickly getting just from this one session, right? It's not my final marks, but I have a lot of data to go on. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Um, very quickly, my next slide, I'm also just keeping track of any little notes that come up. Um, like they're not using passé composé properly, so maybe I need a mini lesson. It seems like a lot, but again, remember my goal is in this environment to get the students talking the most. I might have to prompt them with a few questions. So in coupe de considération, uh, like I would take about two or three minutes at the end of that session and give them feedback right away of what I heard. So they're getting that timely feedback. Uh, and it's a small group, so I probably can tell Adam, you know, you, you interrupted a couple of times, next, next time we do this, uh, do your best to wait your turn, right? So it's that timely feedback. A lot of teachers I find I have conversations with are concerned as to what the other students in the class are going to do. Um, so some ideas are they can be off doing some activity day coups. And if you have the bit.ly to the slideshow, I've linked a few of my favorite go-tos to find things. Activity de lecture, and I like using blogs that are well-written. Uh, Curium is a magazine um, from the Debrouillard group. Again, it's for a bit older um, uh, and so forth. 
Okay. Uh, they, so they can be off doing some tasks that are a little more independent at this time. All right. Merci, Jordan. And merci pour le lien. Next step, and I'm just going to um, pop over this slide as well, uh, Jordan, is we're going to talk about impromptu activities or spontaneous talk activities. And I just have to credit um, Canadian Parents for French and OMLTA for all these ideas. In fact, on the next slide, um, there's a link to Canadian Parents for French. And I just want to reference what I said on the last slide. We can keep it on this one, Jordan, that's perfect. But um, the goals of the program are to increase opportunities for spontaneous talk, create situations where students are using familiar vocabulary in a context, and it gives us a chance to assess ability, confidence, next step. So if we go to the next one, uh, you can see a couple of pictures there. The students get these pictures. And actually, Jordan, if we go back one, please. Um, the students get these pictures and they have a, an amount of time to think about what they're going to say, but not enough time to write it down because we want spontaneous talk. And one of the fears that we're going to circle back to tonight is the idea that students are getting help at home. And we have to be able to shift that idea of getting help to, some, <clears throat> to something useful for our students. So if our students have long enough to think about what they want to say, but not long enough to produce or to, to produce written work, um, it, it's a good thing. It takes a lot of practice to get there. So Jordan, we'll go to the next slide. And what I would say is we need to practice these activities each day. So uh, students can do them independently using like Aaron, or like, uh, Aaron said, Flipgrid, Vocaroo, phone apps, and thank you, Aaron. I didn't realize Moat was now an option on Google Slides. So all of those options are ways students can record their voices. We teach students sentence starters so they know, and especially our core French students succeed when they have those. So we practice those. And then we move into, and, and Canadian Parents for French, you can sign up and get your board, actually, if your French consultant hasn't done this yet. I'm uh, just going to slide it out there to my French consultant colleagues that are in the call. Canadian Parents for French does offer the package right now this year for all of your schools and your board to purchase uh, all of the activity pieces uh, for the impromptu activities, and it's well worth it. Um, I did this with a high school group, and we can go to the next slide, um, Jordan. Um, those are our look fors. That's at each level, and you can kind of read through at each level how it looks different. Um, and then we're looking to evaluate these things. And uh, Gen K is the best. I completely agree with that, along with all the other consultants on the call. Um, so, and these are the things that we want to evaluate as we are going through um, all of our activities. But I wouldn't say evaluate them all. Um, that is correct. Sorry, and I'll come back to those. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't read the chat right now. So. Um, we don't want to evaluate all of these at once. Focus on one thing. Break it down into small steps for yourself. So what, on one day, just listen to the students for their language structures or their fluidity. OK, Jordan, next slide, please. We can do it individuel. And I told you how you could do that in recording. But you can also have individual meet times with your students and have them speak back to you. You can even bring in people like retired French teachers from your board parent volunteers perhaps that speak French if they're cleared, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, petit group, you can do, do small group meetings and have one picture that they each speak about. Grand group where you put different uh, meets in the, um, in the chat. And I didn't mean to create such uh, controversy over the Canadian Parents for French thing, but it's a very small cost for them to keep sustaining their activities in a year where they can't run the the, uh, their speech competitions that, that boards do pay for for students to go to. So I just want to put that out there. It's well justified. Okay, moving on to the next uh, slide, please. My last thought before I pass it on to Haley is shifting our ideas to process and metacognition. And that is to say, when we're evaluating um, only product, that's where we fall into the trap of not being sure sometimes how much help a student may or may not have had. But if we take our work, and we can go to the next slide, Jordan, thank you. If we take our work, and again, these are the two metacognition expectations, and I just want to point out, in both cases, core French and immersion, 
for our older students, but also for our younger students, we're talking about explaining um, which of a variety of strategies they find helpful before, during, and after, and evaluate how they can become better speakers, essentially, or writers in this case. Speakers are in there as well. Okay, and we'll flip forward because the thought is don't only focus on a written product, but push your students to give you um, their thoughts on things like which expressions connect well with your audience, uh, which vocabulary was the hardest to work with. That's opening the door to say, um, you use Google Translate, that's fine, but which vocabulary did you need it for? What didn't you know how to say? How would you say this in a different context? Um, which paragraph are you most proud of that you wrote? How did you create it? What were your steps? And I want to encourage this also, like Aaron said earlier, to be done orally using something like a screencastify or Vocaroo. So those are just some tips and tricks that, that I have in mind. My big message for you is our curriculum really gives us open doors to shift the way we think about our students' learning process. And it's quite all right to really focus on learning process rather than just final product, because we know learning a language is a process that we never truly finish. So merci beaucoup. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Haley. now. Oh, you know, before I do that, can we go back one? And thank you, Haley. Give me a moment. I forgot this was here. One more tidbit from the curriculum. On page 16 in the, in the uh, elementary curriculum and around the same page in the secondary curriculum, there is a paragraph that gives us permission as second language teachers in immersion to modify, or not modify, to adapt how we're meeting expectations to the best practices to meet our language learning needs. And there's the paragraph there that you can see. Uh, and I will now pass it to Haley. Thank you. Haley, le micro. Merci, Jordan. C'est l'histoire de ma vie ces jours-ci. Uh, bonne soirée, tout le monde. Um, je suis vraiment heureuse d'être parmi vous ce soir. Uh, J'apprécie qu'on qu prend le temps, um, notre temps précieux, um, après des, des journées assez pleines. Alors, merci, uh, merci d'être parmi nous aussi. Um, so, tonight I'm going to uh, just share with you some snippets and thoughts in terms of strategies to support some in-the-moment assessment with our students in our virtual classroom setting. Um, certainly applicable to our hybrid uh, students as well. Many are adaptable. Um, so, uh, Jordan, if you can just go, go ahead, thanks. Um, so I, I think most of us can relate to the black box at the bottom of our screen, um, depending on what grade level we're, we're teaching. Um, it, it's, it's a very different reality from being in our classroom, being in our bricks and mortar buildings, and uh, being able to read the room, um, you know, with, quick, with, with a quick glance, a quick sort of walk around. Uh, we're really able to get a pulse on things, and, and that luxury uh, becomes becomes kind of cumbersome in a in a virtual setting and so um, some of these strategies here are going to enable enable us to really gather snippets of information quickly while we're teaching uh, to be able to respond to to what we're seeing and and, and sort of um, capitalize on on those moments so um, the general term for these types of, of sort of rapid assessments are what we call universal response. And, and so what we have here are um, simultaneous replies from the students in our classroom um, where we're, we're really asking our question, giving that think time, and, and then having them reveal their response um, all together. And, and the principle behind a universal response is that it really sort of takes away that uh, sort of riding the coattails uh, syndrome that we, we sometimes might see. And so um, with this, we're, we're able to sort of keep our pulse on things very quickly. Um, the, the research tells us, oh, sorry. The research tells us that uh, we have anywhere between seven and 11 minutes uh, to sort of, um, do our teaching and after that window 
depending on the age of our students, uh, we start losing them. So we really need to be thinking about how are we engaging? How are we bringing our learners in back to the table every seven to 11 minutes to sort of keep them, keep them with us and keep them, keep them learning and engaged. And so um, a lot of these strategies we need to sort of um, twist and reemploy frequently throughout our day to, to, um, to keep them engaged. Okay. So one of the um, universal responses that, uh, that I use quite often is called a waterfall chat. Uh, and so using the chat tool in whatever platform it is that you're using, um, students respond all at the same time. And so what I'll do is I'll ask a question of my learners. I'll give them some think time. Sometimes I might have... Um, a sensory timer up on the board, depending on the task. If it's just uh, a quick response, then I will give them sort of a quiet countdown with my fingers and, and they will see. Um, I keep the chat closed. They have time to think. I will open my chat up and then I give them um, an appropriate amount of time to compose their response. And, and they know we, we, we practiced a lot. Um, they have to wait for that countdown. So I will say three, two, one, and then everybody hits the send button at the same time. Uh, I get a flood of responses that I can quickly scan, um, but I can also uh, save my chat so that I can go back to it and sort of, one, see who is engaging, and two, uh, get a quick glance at sort of what information everybody is giving me. Um, so it's usually quite accurate because everyone is, is, is sharing at the same time. And so it does give me a good sense of who's where. Um, so let's give one a try. We're going to go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and so my ask is, est-ce que tu préfères la classe virtuelle ou la classe physique? Et si tu peux me donner une petite raison pourquoi, alors je vais vous donner un petit moment pour, uh, pour écrire, pour rédiger. Et... On va attendre avant qu'on qu partage la réponse. Alors, 3, 2, 1, envoyez. Et voilà. Merci. So, I can take this information, quickly glean, um, I, I, I wouldn't have 84 <laughs> responses in my classroom. I would have a smaller number. Uh, and what I'll often do with that information, depending on how, where I want to take my discussion, is um, I, I will then create some breakout rooms to, to have my students engage in further. So perhaps I want, my, I want a mix and I want to have a couple of each side or, or I want to have both sides represented in any case. Uh, and, and maybe they're going to try to convince one another of, of, their, of their stance, of their arguments. Um, so they, they would then uh, engage in a short discussion in a breakout room. I would pop in, uh, listen, I, I would uh, use. I would have my my anecdotal sheet, and, and I would be uh, with my look fors, and my students know what they are. I would be sort of documenting. I'd be sort of pushing their thinking, getting some justification, and, and sort of pushing those conversations a, a little bit further um, to get behind their thinking. So that's the waterfall chat. Um, Another low-tech option um, are response cards. So you can use, depending again on your platform, you can use your um, response tools. Uh, Zoom has a number of them. You can use your raise hand feature. Um, or you can go completely old school. My, uh, my virtual students have a, a little baggie and um, we switch it up, I switch it up just to sort of, um, although it's very much the same logic and it's very much the same type of question, just that simple act of, of um, maybe doing red green cards for agree, disagree, or happy face, sad face. Um, I might have the letters A through D for multiple choice questions. Um, I would have a true false card. I might have some key phrases printed uh, response boards, um, so like a whiteboard or a chalkboard, are, are very much effective for this. 
uh, if, if you want to get to some more constructed responses. Um, just make sure you ask them to write with a marker so you can actually read it when they pop it up. Um, and the other response that I, that I like to, um, to use is, is uh, pop in, pop out. So I might give a question and I, I have everybody sort of pop out to start. And then I give them their options and they pop in as, as, as they choose. Um, so just short, really quick activities to, um, to get them sort of engaging in, in your lesson, giving you feedback, giving opinions, uh, and then you're using that information on the fly um, assessment as learning uh, to sort of inform your next steps and, and really promote, um, promote some, some thinking and some engagement with your students. Um, you can also use these as sort of temperature checks as well. So as you're teaching to have your students uh, sort of show their red green or, or whatever codes you want to use so that um, that you're able to sort of read the room, so to speak, as well with that. Thanks. Okay. So some of the um, questions types that I might use for for these um, for these um, rapid responses or universal responses and, and cards. Fait ton choix, so a ou b, d'accord, pas d'accord. Um, I'm a big fan of the dicté zero faute, which uh, kind of is uh, lines up with Aaron's uh, tweakté. Uh, so very short and sort of let's look at how we've written it and, and uh, sort of work through work through uh, our 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 structure. Um, if I'm doing, uh, if I'm teaching sort of more of a content area or for my secondary students, uh, if I'm reading sort of a B1, B2 level text and I want to have them um, sort of distill the information in the text, I might have them pull out cinq mots clés and, and just really quickly jot them down on a whiteboard or jot them down, in, um, get them ready in the chat um, to, to be able to, again, um, get them into breakout rooms, um, but I'll talk more about um, some, some uh, low prep, high yield strategies as well coming up. Those are just some, I some ideas. Another universal response uh, structure um, that takes some time to, uh, to sort of get going, um, but when, once our students know them, uh, they're, they're very efficient, um, is uh, sort of a thumbs up, thumbs down response. Um, we can also use sort of a fist to five code. Uh, and, and this sort of code is great um, for promoting discussion in terms of uh, hot topics um, and uh, sort of CFR inspired um, discussions. So uh, if, I'm, if I'm going to provide a, a prompt or a provocation, uh, I might have students respond. Um, so uh, that the fist would, would mean that uh, I'm not really ready yet. I need some more information. So uh, those are my listeners, and then they need some time to process, and that's okay. One finger up uh, might tell me that they disagree, and they can share many reasons why they might disagree with a, with a particular question. A uh, question might be, um, should masks be mandatory in a kindergarten classroom, for example, or something that, something that they'll, they'll, they'll really be able to engage with. Um, two fingers, I disagree, and I can offer one reason why. Three fingers, I'm not sure yet. Um, four fingers, I agree, and I can offer one reason. And five fingers, I'm all in. I can offer many reasons to justify my opinion pertaining to this particular topic. Um, and these hand signals are really valuable for me when I'm making my breakup, breakout rooms um, because I want to have a balance of, of students who, who have information to share, students who need to hear more. Um, and after they've come out of those breakout rooms, they've now had an opportunity to, to really process and, and distill the information uh, and then construct their own independent responses. Um, so it really is supportive of uh, scaffolding the learning for, for our students who who may be less expressive because um, they're able to, to, um, to benefit from other people's contributions and, and sort of then come up and make their own. So hand signals. Uh, so um, 
one of the hot topics that we might use is on devrait permettre l'utilisation du portable ou de téléphone portable dans l'auto, bien sûr avec un, un Bluetooth, oui ou non. Um, on, on parle d'une de, de nouveaux lois où on peut même sanctionner si uh, même si ce n'est pas le, le conducteur, mais si c'est le passager. Donc, uh, on, on va en discuter, on va en parler uh, et on peut on peut um, justifier nos nos uh, nos pensées. Voilà. Um, I know uh, as uh, virtual teachers. Um, time is precious. The planning uh, can can be overwhelming. Uh, I'm a huge fan of using thinking routines. So uh, there's two sites that are linked there. So if you're if you're in with the Bitly, you can uh, you can get in. Unfortunately, I haven't found an amazing site in French. If anybody knows of any, uh, I just sort of translate and use them as needed. Um, but they're very comprehensive. The Thinking Pathways site. Um, provides a lot of um, photographs of samples of what that thinking routine looks like once students have engaged with it and, and completed their thinking, uh, their visible thinking around uh, whatever routine it is that you're using. Um, so those are, those are my two go-to sites. And um, it, you, will, you will find that... Uh, if you're if you're using either content area information, so science, social studies, there's a lot of great thinking routines um, surrounding um, finding important information, pulling out key points, uh, and if you're using um, texts that are for your French classroom for CEFR inspired discussion and and um, discussing your opinion, uh, there, there are very specific thinking routines surrounding those as well. So once you've used them, the students become familiar with them and you will, you will see that uh, as you sort of deconstruct after you, you've used them, um, the quality just gets better and better every time once, they're, once, once they become routine. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to give those two sites a, a quick check. So some of my favorite that I, that I use uh, are give one, take one. So um, if we're doing, for example, a listening activity, I might, it could be as simple as vocabulary words we hear for our core French, um, for our core French students. Uh, as we increase in, in um, level, then we can say give one, we can, we can have students come up with a sentence to, to sort of capture the essence of the text. Um, so it's really flexible in terms of what that one is. Um, but the idea is that the students work independently and then they are able to pair up, share a piece of information and, and sort of take away one after, after a few exchanges. Uh, I ask them to then take away one new piece of information or one new way of thinking um, that they hadn't considered. Um, so they're able to interact with a few, with a few students and, and then uh, hear many ideas and, and sort of take one away. Uh, a five-word summary is, uh, is another great thinking routine. Uh, so with this, um, you can have students uh, isolate or distill important information. Um, the idea with this is then uh, once, once I've done the reading, the students sort of identify five important words uh, related to the reading or the text or the listening that they've done. They then pair up with a partner and they have to come to consensus. So each person will share their five words and together they have to uh, eliminate five or come to a consensus on five. That group of two then becomes a group of four. And again, they go through that same exercise of um, coming to consensus on five words. So it really encourages uh, students sort of um, justifying why their word is important and, and really talking about the content of the text and, and why, why they've sort of settled or landed on those words. Um, and my other, one of my other favorite uh, thinking routines is sentence, phrase, word. So again, uh, we, we read a text or we listen to a video uh, I'm going to document one sentence that is important to me or maybe that was impactful to me. Uh, I'm going to isolate one phrase and then lastly one word. And, um, and then um, 
we can we can then share we can partner we can partner up and and sort of exchange ideas uh and then possibly as a class we can we can consolidate and, and come up with with uh with a consensus there or uh we can compose uh a short summary there's there's lots you can do with these with these routines all right and um one of the other one of the other uh, tools that that will keep keep our students engaged and give us uh, snapshots are our polling tools. Um, Aaron did talk about uh, a few of these: uh, Kahoot, Pear Deck, Nearpod. Uh, there there are also Poll Everywhere and Mentimeter. Uh, if you haven't used Mentimeter, Mentimeter has a lot of different functionalities within it. Um, one of my favorites is the Word Cloud. So uh, again, with those five words. Uh, you can actually have students isolate their five words and then um, you would set up a Mentimeter. You share that link with them and then students just type in their five words. And then what happens is it will generate a word cloud. And any words that are repeated um, will sort of appear in a larger font. So that gives you uh, as a teacher a really quick visual as to um, sort of what your students are, are pulling from a text and are they on the right track? Um, and when I say text, obviously, I mean um, either a listening text or, or a reading text. It could be, it could be any form, of course. So that leads us to mm -hmm. our um, question and answer period. Uh, I know many submitted ahead of time, and so we, we've pulled a few of those. Um, certainly, if you have any uh, questions relating to anything that, that has been shared this evening, please feel free to pop them in the chat uh, and, and let's, uh, let's problem solve and troubleshoot. All right. Thanks, Haley. So uh, I pulled the top three questions from the registration forms and we're going to put those out there to our panelists. We're also including two extra panelists for our question and answer period. Josette Boss, the president of OMLTA is online. And Antonia Sitang is also available to answer questions. So we're going to throw our first question out there. What if parents or siblings help with student work? I don't know who wants to jump in and start that one, but I'll put it out to our panelists. How do we feel about parents and siblings helping with student work? I can get the conversation started and then I would invite all of my colleagues to jump in. But, but I think what we, what we talked with our virtual teachers about, and this was a long process to get them to the point where this wasn't a, um, <laughs> where this wasn't a, a, a point of, of huge stress, right? It became a point of smaller stress. And that is uh, inviting that partnership and in learning into the, the learning environment and valuing um, from a French perspective, because that's part of our conversation tonight is, is the French or the language piece, you know, uh, capturing that time where the student can be teaching the parent or teaching the sibling some of the learning uh, is one way to, to incorporate that and open the door to those conversations and channel some of the will of parents or siblings to want to be involved in younger students learning. Other ideas on that one? I would echo some of what you said, Adam, that I think one of the, the ideal ways of demonstrating your learning is by being a teacher, right? And mentoring your parents and mentoring your siblings and sharing what you've learned and putting that in your own words. Um, I would also share that if the task is rich, authentic and purposeful, then it is something that is going to be beyond simply helping with rote memorization and fill in the blank kinds of activities. So the more rich and engaging the task, um, the more the child might want to share with the parents and siblings, but not so much to seek help, but to share what it is that they're learning about uh, and demonstrate that passion for whatever the concept is. Um, so really, it, for me, it's the, the focus on conceptual learning and building the competencies in the class classroom versus assigning tasks that are rote based where we would be concerned about them helping quote unquote with the student work. And just to add into that a little I would add to that. Oh. No, go ahead, Josette. Go ahead, Haley. Go ahead, Haley. 
and I'll go after. I was just going to add to that. Um, I think providing parents with, uh, I don't want to say a script, but um, some sort of key questions, some good rich questions that they, that they might ask their child uh, to sort of get at their learning and get at their thinking um, so that they can engage that way as well. And just to sort of add on to what was already said, I think there was a point earlier on looking at how do we how do we set up and structure so that that involvement builds on, but also we've had conversations in our board as well around um, how do we deal with not just parents, but also students using platforms like Bon Patron to correct their work and really thinking about um, what it is and going back to our curriculum and what it is that we are evaluating in their work and are we actually evaluating based on those overall expectations and so are we looking at how do the students understand and demonstrate their learning rather than the mechanics of things? And, you know, things like the grammatical correction, they're gonna, that's a good skill to have. And so using the people in your house, using the tools online, those are good skills to have. And what we wanna do is we wanna set up things where if they're looking for that extra support, it's actually adding and enriching as opposed to pulling away from us being able to actually see what they're learning in an activity. So it's really involved in that rethinking. And I think a key point that somebody made earlier as well is not allowing a long time period. So when you're looking for a demonstration of learning, can you get something that's done in a short time frame where they can't go away and write down and think about and call in six people to help them create their answer, but really giving that shorter time frame where you're really getting what they are able to do in that moment as a snapshot. Um, so I'd just like to add also that we want our students to practice, um, and we were talking about orally, which was um, amazing, uh, all of these conversation about how important oral is. So we want our students to practice all of those sex sentence instructions, uh, structures that they learned. We want them to practice the vocabulary. And if a parent is there, um, because we can't virtually do the same kind of turn and talk that we can do in a classroom, if, if the parent is there, then they can have that little turn and talk with the parent um, or with um, their dog or with their you know, whatever is, whatever is, whatever, whoever is there handy so that they can practice what they're going to say. And then when they come back to, um, to our large meet, then they can uh, demonstrate what they practiced. So um, that way the parents are helping, but they're not really doing the work for the students. Um, another idea is uh, to build a routine when we work with our students and we do different activities, we build routines with them. Well, if there are parents who are eager and want to be involved, then um, maybe build a routine for them. Or this is this is where when it's a good time to share and this is when um, it's not a good time to share because I need to be able to find out what the students can do by themselves. So I know that what my next steps will be when I'm teaching. Excellent, thank you. Our next question, the question of the night. How do I assess students when so many are using Google Translate? So we've had a lot of questions around Google Translate and how to work around that. And we've had a few interesting discussions amongst the panelists and maybe they can share their thoughts now. So Google Translate could be a good tool, but um, it's the assessing part that we're we're struggling with, right? Like when when can how do we know that what the student is writing is actually what they're writing? So some ways to do that is uh, again limiting the time, so letting the students write something or doing it um, all together. Have um, a, a shared document or Google Slides where the students are each adding at the same time so that you can actually see them writing and what they are contributing, you know that it's authentic because they're doing it right there while you're there. That's one idea. I think turning those uh, written tasks, if if we're if we're using uh, Google Translate, uh, into a into a follow up discussion somehow, and really hearing the students um, 
discussing what they've written uh, will we'll provide some really great insight into, into uh, how much they've learned as well. I want to point out Hilda's point, I think, in the uh, chat just now, and I like that one too, that using Google Translate or uh, another tool, the first time you don't know how to say something can be a very acceptable thing to do, uh, you, but, but it needs to be reinforced that it's just part of that process of becoming independent um, and being able to integrate that language into our everyday language, both spoken and written. Um, so I think that was a point well made as well. I think it also to the comprehension, understanding what you have written, um, because previously I've had students who have used Google Translate, and when you have a conversation, and, and what does this mean? What were you trying to say? And they can't recall what it is that they were trying to say. So I think that's where that that gap is. That you you know, if they're using it to learn a new word or an expression, by all means, if that enriches their ability to communicate. But if it's simply to get a task done, then I think we need to reevaluate the kind of task that we're giving the students, because um, we really want them to be rich kinds of activities where we get students, like my student said, can we use Google Translate with this? No, we, we've got to use our brains. We have to have a debate about what words to use and why are they okay? So for me, something like that was just so transformative in that the students can't use these tools. They really need to use their minds and speak with one another and use the power of the group to uh, write the text versus the power of the computer, so to speak. I think, Erin, as well, though, you made a really good point. I think, Adam, you might have made the same point. That idea of giving the students the structure to work from as well. I found that when Google Trends is an issue, it's often a lack of confidence. So if you can give them a sense of the structure, you're less likely to jump over to a translator. All right, we're going to put one more question up for our panelists. What are some user-friendly methods of assessing oral components of a language course delivered online? I know we've had a few examples of that throughout our session tonight, but what's everyone's, maybe everyone's top tools? Well, I can start. I, there's there's several tools that immediately come to mind, but there's three that I'll share very quickly. One tool that's been very effective is a tool called Soundtrap. Um, there's many different tools that would do the same function, but it's essentially a podcasting studio and it's collaborative. So the students can be put in a group. Um, it does have video conferencing built within. It also has chat built within. They re can record their audio. They can add sound effects. They can add a musical track. So really, they can collaborate in real time building that audio. Uh, so my students have participated in the FSL Global Read Aloud. And as their culminating task, they were asked to put together uh, a panel discussion just like this in the role of the characters and speak to some prompts about the text. And so they used Soundtrap to record the audio to have that conversation. So they were able to work through the task in Soundtrap and then they were able to build their final product within Soundtrap. And it was a great way of creating a published uh, audio track that could then be shared with um, you know, parents, if I so choose, shows. Uh, the second tool is one that's my go-to, and that would be Flipgrid. Um, and this isn't an English, uh, sorry, a FSL task, but we had done a mystery hangout, and it, it so happens we have a mystery hangout with a class in France coming up in one more day's time. But we, I had collaborated with another teacher, and this teacher was in Iowa, and my students were on a shared Flipgrid, and they had questions for one another about life in a hybrid model, um, what COVID was like for those students and how they were experiencing it differently. And so Flipgrid is really powerful, not just for a prompt that I might give the students, but for its collaborative uses. So here I'm able to collaborate with an American teacher. Our two classes work together through our English Global Read Aloud. And then we had conversation in response to the novel and to our lives as students through Flipgrid. 
Um, so Flipgrid and Soundtrap have been very beneficial. Uh, one that I mentioned in the chat earlier is a tool called Parlay, um, based off the French word Parley. And it is a phenomenal Canadian platform. It's created by a company out of Toronto. And it offers a set of discussion prompts, which have multimedia provocations as well as questions. And the teacher essentially takes a template, copies the template, customizes the prompt, and then can assign this provocation to students either asynchronously or synchronously. Uh, there is French content in the platform, and so if you take a look, it's a really versatile platform which encourages students to communicate. Um, it does offer the ability for students to be anonymous, and so they can't tell with whom they are communicating in the class, but you as the teacher can tell and can get analytics on how often they engage with other students. Um, it even has suggested prompts in terms of how you might respond, so whether you're disagreeing or agreeing, it has some language structures built in, in both English and French, to show the students how to respectfully disagree, for instance. What kind of language can we use to teach them to respectfully disagree in French? Or to say, you know, great idea without just saying, you know, bon travail or bien fait. Um, so it really is a versatile platform. So those would be my top three that people may not be familiar with. Parlay, P-A-R-L-A-Y. Soundtrap, as well as Flipgrid, which is now owned by um, Microsoft and is a really versatile tool in that Microsoft um, bank of digital tools. I like the idea also of uh, having a portfolio, so, co so collecting samples of students speaking over the course of a period of time. Uh, this is uh, one way to facilitate is this is on VLE portfolio, which is a ministry. It's the ministry um, platform. So it's fine to use in any Ontario school board. I've, I've noticed in the chat there's in the chat there were some uh, concerns about which applications we can use and which we can't. So the VLE portfolio again is for for uh, is ministry um, uh, supported and so we can use it at any school board and on there then what you can do some ideas of things that you can do students can take pictures or videos of something they're working on or doing in classroom and then they can comment on it so it also um, promotes metacognition for the students to think about what they're learning and how they're learning it and then they can uh, comment about you know what they think about their work or how they did their work or um, what they're doing with their work and that gives you another um, avenue to listen uh, to their oral language development and um, it's it's kind of cool because you can also can you can also leave feedback for them orally or in writing um, and and eventually what uh, what you can do is also um, choose to share some of that feedback or some of those uh, recordings that the students have done with parents so that parents can also keep track of what's going on and how their children are learning I think, and I know I said it a little bit earlier, but I think my user-friendly method is less um, uh, tied to a single app than it's tied to process. And that is um, take things in as small steps as possible. Don't try and evaluate all your students in one day, one task, one block. Don't try to evaluate all skills. Give yourself that focus of one thing that you're specifically looking for. And if you know that, let's say, Aaron and Josette are struggling with their spontaneous vocabulary, pick one day for spontaneous vocabulary, say Thursday's your spontaneous vocabulary day, and those are the days that you know you're watching Aaron and Josette specifically on that skill. And you can differentiate that way as well. So no matter what tool you're using, um, focus your goals and yourself uh, right from the beginning on what it is that you're looking for. I think having that tool as well, Adam, is um, allows you to do that in the moment assessment as well. Um, some of these um, some of these applications, such as Flipgrid and, and um, others, where students will record and you go back, um, 
although you don't have to listen to all of them, it is it is uh, time consuming to sort of go back on all of those productions. So I think uh, really spending the time to develop those tools that you're going to have at your fingertips and, and sort of use them daily. And I remind my kids every day, we, we, we start our interactions with uh, our understanding of what our success criteria are for that interaction. What am I listening for? What am I looking for? Let's do it. And it's in the moment. And I, I choose a few every day. And so by the end of the week, I want to have my little square box. I'm, I'm old school. I have my paper pencil. And uh, I, have, I have that little box for every kid. There's, there's something in there um, anecdotally. And um, it's gold. I think Ellie is so on point with that. I used to... Um... One of the things I found particularly useful at the beginning of a year, at the beginning of a term, is sit down with the students and create um, co-construct the success criteria for oral communication so that they know anytime we're doing an oral communication activity, these are the things I'm looking for. And then you can remind them and refer them back to that so that they have that right, in, right sort of front of mind. They know I'm looking for, are you using the vocabulary? Are you using the language structures? What are we looking for when you're adding a comment? Is it enriching the conversation? You know, what all those things that are really important to us and linked back to the curriculum. And the two others that I would put in there is Book Creator is a great one. And then if you happen to be a board that uses Google, the read and write tool that allows you to add voice comments and voice notes is fantastic. And one of the things you can even do super fast, super easy, you give the students either a text or a video prompt at the top of a Google Doc, stick their names in there. Their job is to just highlight their name and add a voice comment related to that prompt that you gave them. And then other students can also type their name in underneath and attach a voice comment responding to what somebody else said. So this made me think that I agree, I disagree. Again, give them those sentence starters, but it's a really fast, really easy way to just get them creating that spontaneous oral production and link that rubric right back in so they remember what those success criteria are that you're looking for. Super quick, super easy, but gives you some really rich data. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'm going to just do a few things before we kind of move on and open the floor up to questions if there are any, because there are quite a few people that need to leave because it is getting to that time. Um, I posted a link in the chat for your feedback. We really appreciate hearing what you have to say about this session and about what we can do to provide upcoming sessions for you if you'd like to learn a little more. Our last webinar in the bricks and mortar series will take place two weeks from tonight effective blended learning in fsl on february 16th and the link is there as well as on our website and all of our social media and one more plug before i open up the floor our omltaa spring conference is coming soon and our call to presenters is out if you are interested in sharing with us it will be a virtual conference please uh, click the link and submit and uh, join our presentation. Is there anyone that would like to ask a question to our panelists before we wrap up for this evening? Lots of thank yous. I know we've answered a lot of questions along the way. So I would like to thank all of our panelists this evening. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you all so much. For those looking for the recording, they will be sent out uh, as soon as everything is processed. You'll get this in your email. Thank you all very much. I'm going to stop. The